All right, let's do this thing. Let's talk it out. So number one, uh, why don't we start with maybe raw, I actually like raw material. We could both, we could all agree this is not aged. Or if it's aged, it's not aged for a period of time that takes on color, right? Sometimes, <clears throat> actually that's mis that maybe is misleading because I mean sometimes you might have something like uh, an, aged, an aged rum that's then like filtered of color, right? That's totally possible. So I shouldn't, I shouldn't. They're, they're always outliers. They're outliers, no right. Matter okay, what. but let's, let's assume for a second, maybe this is unaged, this first one. Um, fruit or grain or cane or what are, what are we thinking here? Does anyone have an opinion? Fruit. Does anyone here think something other than fruit? Are we all on the same page? What do you think? Grain. Okay, uh, if it were to be a grain, what, where, where would you go? So grains, I, we have corn, we have rye, we have wheat, we have barley, we have rice as a grain also. And then, I was thinking a melange. A melange, a melange of, of grain. So maybe something, so if this is an unaged grain-based distillate, then it would be something like a white dog, like a fruity white dog. Yeah, or something like grain and maybe juniper. Grain and juniper, like a gin, so botanical, or, or jennifer. Very good. Okay, um, and for other people, the majority here thinks, thinks fruit. Uh, we have lots of fruits that are available to us, right? I mean, we have apple eau de vies and pear eau de vies and raspberry. I mean, we sell this guy, this Rise at Hans Reisepower eau de vies that goes everywhere from like ginger to elderberry to like all this stuff. Um, do, we, do we have an opinion on what type of fruit we're talking? Say again? Or, or orchard fruit, so like an apple or, or a pear or something like that. Anyone have a different opinion? Apricot. So something light and stone fruity. You could taste maybe that marzipan quality going on. Anyone else? It could be grape. Could be grape. That's true. It could be grape. Um, right, grape. I always get that raisinous quality in grapes. Like sometimes it's hard to capture uh, like fresh grape, like eating a table grape. But I often get like raisinous qualities in when it's a grape, something like that. Um, okay. Anyone have a different opinion? Anyone here think it's something number one, something other than either grain or fruit? No. Okay. Uh, do we think it is sweeter or drier than the second one? Sweeter. Sweeter, sweeter than the second one. Okay. Um, the second one, if it were to be a color, right? Is that color more along the scale of you know blues and like super jammy and fruity, or more like your greens and yellows in quality? Uh, we're just kind of going to go back and forth right now rather than, I think, I think that there's only two here. It's easy to go back and forth and kind of compare and contrast. Cool with that? Yeah. Okay, great. Green and yellow. Green, green and yellow? Okay. So we said sweeter. The first one's sweeter than the second one. Color's green. Uh, do, let's see. What, how do we feel about proof? First one's more red. Second one's more green and yellow. Uh, does one of these have more acidity than the other one? Can you feel acidity? You think second has more acidity to it. Uh, and how about body? First one has more body or less body? More body. More body. Less body. OK, very good. Um, Do we have guesses on proof for the first one? 46. 46. 46. <coughs> 42, right? What about the second one? 40. Right around 40, right, OK. Do you want to drink the first one on its own or mix it or both? Both. both. More towards mixing. Right. Do you find this first one, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, some of these questions might just be loaded questions <laughs> open for disasters of answers. But do you, do you find this first one enjoyable? Yeah? Um, do you see yourself thinking about food when you taste this first one? Is this something that you could see working with food? Yeah? And how about the second one? More as a mixer, and, and maybe more difficult to like apply to food. Green, uh, those green, uh, more grassy or more fruity? Grassy. grassy on number two. Okay. Um, but it's do, still fruity. Still fruity. It's apparent. It's just not. On yeah. The right. Pretty. Second one's pretty dry. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's cer certainly in contrast, right? Okay. Um, why don't we talk about this first? We didn't talk about distillation or anything like that, which is not going to be so apparent. It's, I mean, it's, there's a reason why we paired these two together, yes. actually. Yeah, actually. Um, 
Yeah, because of distillation, which is a, a thing that we, we could have sort of added to this criteria, sort of the conversation about what you're perceiving from column still versus pot. Um, but we, there's so much we could have talked about. There's so much. And just to be clear, I mean, and, and there's examples all over the place. It's really hard to, like, make a definitive statement. You know, pot stills, we know, like, a lot of whiskeys are distilled in pot stills. Often, like, things like eau de vie can be, like, a combination of a pot and a column. People talk about column stills as, like, oh, you know, we do this single distillation in a column still, yet the other word for a column still is a continuous still, so there's, like, a continuous distillation happening. It's all a little bit complicated, but the reason that we actually paired these two together is because they both like hail from the same uh, origin sort of and also the same technique of distillation. Uh, so the reveal on the first one, why don't we do that? Um, does anyone have any other comments or questions before we dive into what this thing is? Good? Good. Okay. So this first one is Blanched Armagnac. So this is a grape-based distillate. Okay. Uh, from a region of Armagnac. So if, you, if you've never been to, to, to France or if you don't know, uh, in the south of France, southwest of France, is a region called Gascony. Um, it is, uh, this is the home of, of waterfowl. This is the home of foie gras. This is like the, the country, the rural cousin of cognac would be Armagnac. Um, and blanched Armagnac is something that all Armagnac producers produce at this point in the game. They kind of are, have been trying to make a big push. It actually has its own appellation now and laws that govern it um, in order to kind of combat and kind of join in the success that vodka has. Uh, granted, some French producers also make vodka. I mean, Grey Goose comes from, from, from France, from Champagne. Um, this is a Blanche Armagnac. Uh, the grape this is made from is, is called Full Blanche, right? Full Blanche. There are four different grapes that are predominantly used to make Armagnac. You have on the high musical scale of things, like Maxwell singing in falsetto or whatever. Uh, not everyone knows Maxwell. Anyway, uh, the person singing on their tippy toes in falsetto. Uh, you have like Full Blanche and Uni Blanc, which Uni Blanc is the same grape used in cognac. These are grapes that have pretty high acidity. Uh, and, and lower contents of sugar. Um, and then on the lower end of things, you have grapes called columbar and a grape called baco. And baco, think about baco as like your baritone. Uh, it has lower acidity, more sugar. It also, it, because of that, it ages quicker. Acidity leads to a slower aging process uh, where sugar, think about it, I mean, this is a liqueur, we put it here and it just oxidizes in the sun versus something that maybe is higher in acidity, it slows down the process of oxidation. Um, everyone will keep a, keep a bottle of this in their freezer, and maybe in the middle of a meal, you're sitting there eating all of this really decadent riette and whatever it may be. They pull this out and pour a chilled shot of it, either directly into a glass into your mouth, or maybe over a small scoop of sorbet, and you go ahead, and as the sorbet melts, you drink the shot, you know, you eat your sorbet and then drink this chilled shot uh, of, of, like, you know, seasoned Armagnac, blanched Armagnac, uh, and that's called a true Gascogne. Uh, and in, in Normandy, they do that with Calvados, blanched Calvados, and that's called a true Normand. In fact, there's a restaurant in a bar, a restaurant in California, in San Francisco, called True Normand, and these are guys who like obsess over brandy as a category, um, and, and this has been adopted throughout the country, which is awesome. Um, does this remind us of another, any other spirits that this reminds us a lot of? Blanche Armagnac? Is there another? Pisco, yeah. So this could be if you wanted to go ahead and create a menu that maybe was more specific, whether uh, it's the name of the cocktail being more kind of veering towards French, um, or you wanted to use other French ingredients and kind of keep it tight and in that French aesthetic, you know, this is a great way to do that. Alcohol, 42%. Spot on, KJ. Um, I want to say that they add a touch of sugar to this. They add a touch of sugar to this. Is it sugar or glycerin? I think it's sugar at the very end. It's not a lot, but I think it's just a touch to round out to make it a very pleasurable style. You know, uh, people can have different opinions about sugar, uh, whether, whether you know, we frown upon it, whether we don't frown upon it. Someone who doesn't add sugar is certainly going to talk smack about the person who does add sugar. They're like, yeah, well, I arrived at this thing without sugar. Fair enough. But there's something to be said about doing it in a way that is not offensive. You know, when I taste a cognac that has uh, sugar added, but I can't tell, you did a really good job. You know, and, and some of these producers do a really bad job, and it's the reason that people taste a good cognac and like, ugh, it tastes hot, it tastes dry. 
Uh, it's because they're used to drinking maybe like really sweet cognacs that are like totally adulterated. Um, cool? Cool. Yeah. Uh, obviously, this would be also be a great ingredient to maybe macerate things in. I could see like maybe instead of doing like brandied, like brandied fruits in something that's a darker spirit, this would add like a real kind of like jammy, fruity, raisinous, and unadulterated quality. No oak getting in the way from something like that. This could be, this could be nice. Um, cool? Cool. Column distilled. Single distillation, a single continuous distillation on a column still, on what's called an Armagnac still. You know who else uses Armagnac stills? Uh, our number two, as a matter huh. of fact. It's really funny you should say that. Our number two. This is Rum JM, okay? It tastes green and grassy because it's made from a green grass. That makes a ton of sense. Uh, also distilled on an Armagnac still. Um, this, is, this makes total sense because Martinique, here's a question that's on the master psalm test that everyone gets wrong because people don't focus enough on spirits. What's the southern most French AOC? Everyone like immediately goes towards southern mainland France when in fact the answer is Martinique and the Caribbean is a part of France, right? Um, you want to talk about agricole? Yeah, I mean, I have, I have that happily been, been here to JM specifically. Um, so we, we have a couple different agricoles in our portfolio. Um, Rum JM from Martinique and even more specifically uh, the, the area where this habitation is and where they're growing their cane Volcanic soil is right up near, on the mountain. Near on a volcano, a volcano. yeah. Uh, and a lot of drainage. So now you, you are getting cane that is especially uh, acidic. Uh, it is going to have a little bit more of that green and grassy, perhaps more than the Dan Oiseau, which we also carry. Their water source is also volcanic water. Like it's a spring that comes up from underneath, and you could taste. I mean, I know minerality is really hard to like pinpoint what it is because when you test it, there is no minerals that are taking place. But nonsense. You taste it. I mean, maybe in the water, maybe in grapes, it, it's, it's a little different. But in the water, you put it in your mouth, and it is like tingles your tongue and has like salinity to it and mineral and a drying quality to it as well. Certainly, any whiskey producer would tell you that the water is one of the most important components to yeah. what they do. So, I mean, totally. it's not a new idea by any means. When you talk about agricole, I mean, agricole makes up a super small percentage of the world's rum. I think it's like less than five. JLB, what do you got? Less than five percent? Yeah, less than five percent. Less than five percent. Three percent. Most stuff is called rum. We're leaving out the Pavia Rock. We're leaving out the Shasta. Right. Okay, less than 3%. Like if someone was like, I'll have the rum and Coke and you poured a rum JM and Coke, they would spit it back at you and say, I did not ask for a grappa and Coke or a tequila and Coke. Like those are, those are like the things that people say because most people are used to molasses-based spirits, rums, um, where this is, this is not that. This is made from the raw material, so it makes a ton of sense. Anyone who's ever you know, been to, whether it's a Latin American comp uh, country or maybe uh, this is big in, in Asia as well, like chewing on sugar cane or drinking sugar cane juice, there's no mistaking what this is. This is, you know, it's sweeter than water, but it's not as sweet as processed sugar. It is green and grassy and lean and mineral. When you taste this, compared to maybe uh, an agricole from something like Guadalupe, the neighboring, uh, the neighboring island, um, that neighboring island produces sugar cane that, um, you know, it's cooler nights, it's warmer days, um, it's more fruity and flamboyant in the way it is as it expresses itself. Uh, if you're talking wine, I always like to say like, Damoiseau is like the New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc where it just like jumps out of the glass in this really fruit driven style where this is the Sancerre. It's a little bit more tight and reserved and lean and mineral and grassy. I've always loved that descriptor flamboyant. Like we use, use that often when we're talking about cognacs as well. Yeah. We get into the, the older, older stuff. Um, because it does sort of like for me imply this like about ready to fall off the vine or like super ready to be harvested yeah. fruit quality where it's like as ripe and like as succulent as it could possibly get. And this stuff begs for sugar. There's a reason why it's used in so many tiki cocktails. And like if you go to the island, what's the drink of the island? Tea punch. What's in tea punch? It's, it's sugar. Sugar. It's, it's an old fashioned. Tea punch is an old fashioned. You pour a couple of fingers of pick a pick an agricole, you pour a splash of a sugar cane syrup usually made on the island, and then you scalp a lime. Not lime, this is not a daiquiri, we're not squeezing lime juice in. We're taking the scalp that maybe has a touch of citrus underneath, and you drop it in, ice, 
Maybe if you got it, not everyone has ice. Also, it's 110 degrees, and like that ice is going to turn to water in like 10 seconds. So like, what's the point? Uh, really, it's just like an old-fashioned spec, essentially. Uh, it's really easy to manipulate that old-fashioned spec also once you know how to make it, obviously, as many of us know. Um, do you remember the um, uh, Neats and Sweets seminar we did? Do you remember the pairing with the jam? Which of the most lovely cheeses? Uh, we did uh, goat. Uh, no, was it cow? I think it was no. I think it was it was like a sheep. It was a sheep's milk triple cream, because now you start thinking you're like, okay, grassy. Where else do I see grassy flavors exist in food? Everything else that we paired was all like kind of more obvious in that it was salty and bitter and chocolatey and sweet and like all these pairings with rum and whiskey. And one of the most interesting pairings of the entire of the entire day was rum JM paired with a triple cream, something like a camembert. Uh, because you know, when you taste something that like, you know, has been eating grass in a pasture its entire life, that is apparent. And, and here, you're playing into that. Rather than being like a stark contrast, you're complementing the two. And that's a great way to think of things uh, in terms of food pairings that is maybe lesser known. Uh, as far as Jay and Blanc is concerned, they do make uh, a lower proof and a higher proof, 40% uh, for the one we did. So. Spot on, spot on leap, and then they do a, a, um, a 100 proof as well, which often you know it can be really great for cocktails, but um, certainly for something like that food pairing we did, or maybe if someone's still getting used to the idea of agricole, something that's a little bit lower in proof, a little bit more friendly, something that's around what um, French cognac is often yeah. introduced at, something like that might be quite nice. Uh, this is also aged for six months because it's required by law in the AOC to be aged, and then they filter out the color. Uh, we have another one uh, from Damoiseau. Damoiseau is 110 that has this golden hue. It's just they decide to not filter it out. That's that's the difference there. Is that aged in oak? Yeah, and it's like food. It's like large foudre. We're not talking about like we're not talking about like toasted oak or charred oak. We're not trying to get in the way. It's more about uh, a process of like letting alcohol kind of mellow mellow out and oxygen do its thing. Uh, and sometimes and it's neutral. I mean, it's been used over and over and over again. These are 5,000 liter type of like big vats. Something they use that a lot in like throughout France as well. And certainly, when you do get into the aged expressions of JM, then they do char. You know, it's fresh char. It's ex bourbon barrels. Then they then they want that influence. But for this, that's not the point. So that's how we're going to do this game. Uh, okay, without without it taking any more time, um, let's go ahead and dive into flight number two. I'd say take maybe like five or six minutes. Um, don't overthink it. Uh, let's ba bang it out, and then we'll we'll reconvene. Pencils down. Man, Has anyone here ever taken the bar smarts course? You ever done it? Bar five. Bar five. Sorry. Bar five. Similar similar idea. I've never taken it. Similar similar situation. Yeah. One time. Yeah. 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 More intense? Yeah. Sounds intense. A little, yeah, a little more intense. I don't have a beard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, don't have, I don't have a beard and no one and you didn't pay for this. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's right. Very good. Okay. Boy, number one. Let's talk about number one, because like I get tripped up every single time and I'm I'm in love. Um, <laughs> number one, let's talk about, I mean, on the nose here. Where are we at? I mean, where, where, where are we at in terms of like uh, raw, raw material, uh, anything added to it? Uh, let's talk about color. I mean, just start shouting things out here. <clears throat> Floral. Plum. Anything you find acidic on the nose? Like almost like shrubby? Vinegar. Vinegar, a little vinegary, a little lactic. Is that lactic like Parmesan cheese or lactic like goat cheese? Goat cheese. I wonder if this would taste great with Chev. Oh, man. Huh. Uh, anything added to this? Does it have botanicals in it? It seems like it has botanicals in it, right? Sure does. Wild. Um, how about when you taste it here? What are, what are, we, what are we tasting? Are we tasted, tasting fruity or cherry? cherry. Like kirsch, like almost like that marzipan kind of quality to it. Mm -hmm. I've heard that before from this. We did it so much, especially going back. <laughs> we did this for we did this uh, as a trial run for our staff at our sales meeting last um, last week, and then kirsch came up a few times. Cool. Um, how about concentration? Light, light, medium, or full bodied? Me medium to full. Medium full. Um, how about? Uh, Acidity, I mean, feel acidity on the tip of the tongue, and 
it stays with you for quite some time? Does it does it fall flat or does it does it go on? It goes. Kind of lingers, right? There's always there's this term I, I know we hear a lot. I hear a lot in in um, uh, wine, especially talking about like the mid palate, like the mid palate. Think about like the center of your tongue, and you could almost feel like a pressure, like if someone had like is pushing down with their finger on the middle of your tongue. I feel like it's this beautiful balance of sugar to acid. Uh, it has this great concentration without it being cloyingly. Do you find this to be sweet or or not so sweet? Sweet. Off dry, yeah, fruity. It's like the Riesling of whatever this is, right? I mean, at least based on what we tasted before. What do we think about proof? Where is this sitting? Below 45. Below 45? About 40? Right at 90. Right at 90. Right at 90. Mm. Mm -hmm. You want to mix this or drink it neat? Or both? Mix it. You want to mix it? You want to do both? You're paid to say that. Yeah, I was going to say, of course you <laughs> That's not true. That's totally not true. I mean, somewhere in the middle is the truth. Um, hmm. What do you think about uh, the raw ingredient? How about the raw ingredient? Tough. I think grain. Grain. Yeah. Grain. Grain. So what, I mean, if we all... I think it's agave. Agave. Yeah. Agave. Do you take, do you, is, it, is it agave like in the world of tequila or agave in the world of um, mezcal? Do you taste smoke? Bacchanor, so maybe so tall, so not agave, but in that world of agave. Yeah, it's not Briny, yeah, um, yeah, interesting. Ricea-ish. Ricea-ish, interesting. Um, well, I like to compare it to number two. We're gonna we'll reveal the first two together because um, I think that's interesting. Um, let, let's talk about the next one. On the nose, I mean, what, what are we getting? What, what is that? Licorice. Licorice. Mint. Juniper. Juniper. Anybody else? Eucalyptus. Eucalyptus. Yeah. Or cardamom. Cardamom. Yeah. Black pepper. Pepper. And I get, I get, an, I get anise. M more than I get licorice, I get anise, but sort of like in the same vein, right? How about the uh, how about how about the actual uh, base itself? It, I mean, is it is it easy to tell? Is it tough to tell? Does it taste fruity? Does it taste granul granular? Malty. It's not a word. Malty. I think grain again, but I would, I wouldn't be surprised if it was a fruit distillate that botanicals were added to. Mm. It could be a gin that was made with grape distillate. Something like that. Yeah, fruity. Um, do you want this in your gin and tonic? Yeah. Yeah, you do. Do you want this in your bee's knees? I mean, provided it's gin. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> do you want this in your autumnal martini? <laughs> yeah, I do too. Uh, very good. Um, ABV? Some are right around there, but similar, similar, similar ABVs. Um, hmm. Is that enough? Did we talk enough about that? Yeah. I think we did too. Great. This is exciting. Let's do this. <laughs> the first one is Estancia ricea. Mazel, everyone. Uh, what is ricea? Um, ricea is uh, mezcal produced in Jalisco, so tequila country. Um, and you, you see two very different styles that are popping up. There's not a ton of examples on the market to begin with. Uh, some of us are probably more familiar with uh, a brand called Venanosa, uh, which is, you know, you, there's a green one and a black one and an orange one and a blue one, and they spiral like this. And uh, some of them are incredibly, like, lactic, like, cheesy, cheesy, salty, Parmesan, cheesy, funky, estery, and keep, keep, oh, very particular. Um, <laughs> The, the reason that riceas can get like that is because of, a, because of uh, several things. Sometimes they're made coastal, so you get that influence from the ocean itself. Uh, and other times they're made up in the mountains, so you have that lack. Also, temperature then plays into it as well. Um, you know, you have more, uh, you have lower sugar uh, content in some of these uh, agaves, or you know, kind of a greener style of agave that maybe grows in the mountains. For example, this is a mountain style. It almost tastes like it has botanicals in it. I mean, the first time I tasted it, I was like, did you make a gin from your ricea? 
and their response was actually, depending on the time of year that we harvest and produce the ricea, determines the level of sugar being anywhere from 12 to like right around 20 bricks. So think about it like in relation to the Riesling we were just talking about, right? Um, and this is harvested and produced in a time of the year where it's a little bit cooler and there's not as high a sugar uh, content. Also, fermentation, very often with Ricea, you have very lengthy fermentation, um, something that could be you know, upwards of three to four weeks long uh, versus Estancia doing a one-week fermentation, which is much more common when it comes to like your traditional mezcal production uh, throughout Oaxaca and places like that. How big is their still? I think it's like th maybe 350 liter looking still in total. Um, they do a double uh, double distillation, and their still itself is it's like this above ground, almost like egg looking still. I'll show you. I'll show you pictures of it afterwards, um, just to, to paint a better picture. Um, Forty-five percent on this guy. But yeah, they they do a combination in Ricea. You often have a combination of like roasting and steaming. Like you may start by roasting straight with wood, and then you add some water into the actual uh, into the actual pit, and then close it up, and it creates convection and steam. So you often don't end up with the same kind of charred roastiness. Uh, as you do in some mezcals, obviously, as, as many of us know, that mezcal kind of runs the gambit when it comes to smoke. I think most people are like, oh, like, like most people, not just us, but most people, like, oh, mezcal, that's like the smoky tequila with the worm, right? It's like that's obviously not always the case. That, that comes down to economies of scale uh, in terms of how big the batch is and the type of wood being employed, whether it's mesquite or oak or something else. Um, there are a lot of things that play into like smokiness, right? Um, Forty-five percent alcohol, spot on. Okay, um, I like want this like almost as like a gin and tonic. Like I want this with tonic, or I mean, there's a lot of applications. And I don't know if you actually tried mixing it with the next one together, like fifty-fifty, and tasting it, but it tastes just lovely together. Which is Never Sinks Gin, who recently switched to a hundred percent apple distillate. Is this that one? Or is this, this is that one. Yeah, and uh, you know these guys first and foremost are are, are apple brandy O D V producers out of uh, out of uh, Westchester, out of Port Portchester. Thank you. Um, super super lovely dudes, you know, and, and they were taking like their leftover apple mash after doing the apple production, uh, after doing their uh, O D V production, and using that to then make their gin. And now they are going ahead and just like every, and they were also doing grain in there too. And now it's hundred percent apple. Very light on the juniper. I mean, other, uh, there's other uh, gins that remind me, like I'd say like another gin that reminds me somewhat of Neversink is aviation gin in a way, like where you're not like, ah, I, I, that's gin, but like I taste a lot of cardamom, I taste a lot of anise, like it tastes very autumnal, which makes a ton of sense as to why we're showing it right now. Um, I think it's really interesting that like, for, for some reason, because I, I know that this is an apple-based distillate and because apple is such a big part of this brand, that always comes to mind for me as like one of the first things I'm tasting, that mallet quality whenever I'm having it. But today, just sort of having it in a little bit more of a neutral situation compared to the rest of the stuff, the other botanicals are coming out for me so much more than they ever have before, yeah. just because that preconceived situation was sort of pushed to the side for a second, yeah. and I was focusing on the other other thing. I also think it's really easy to, uh, and this not just for this, but in general, you could play into like the tendencies of, of the apple. You know, it's like it'd be easy. Sometimes eau de vie, people want to use eau de vie in cocktails, but eau de vie is a super expensive ingredient, uh, spirit to produce because you know there's no masking imperfections. You have to take super tight cuts on your alcohol, no heads, no tails, then redistill, no heads, no tails. You have this really tight cut, and, and as a result, this is an expensive spirit. And not only that, one, we did not grow up drinking, so we are often uncomfortable paying an arm and a leg for eau de vie, where like you go to Germany, Austria, Switzerland, you know, parts of France, and like that is a custom of the people, have a schnapps after the meal. So it's really easy to say, maybe take a bar spoon or a quarter ounce or maybe a half ounce of something like an apple or pear eau de vie and dosing your gin and maybe splitting the base if you're mixing cocktails or something like that to jack up that apple flavor and kind of play into the tendencies of the apple, which I think is cool. Um, and then obviously from a pairing standpoint, it's en endless here, you know. Uh, Proof-wise, 43%. So, KJ, you're killing it on this. <laughs> I'll, also, I lied to you about the Blanche Armagnac. It was 44, not 42. Sorry. Because <laughs> I'm a lie. Get that off your chest. Simple country lie. OK, uh, let's dive right into the next two. 
I found that this third one, after tasting the one prior to it, like ABV, can you tell higher, higher or lower than the one than the gin? Now that we're going back, taste it again. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, let's talk about raw material. Tastes like sugar cane. Um, so we already tasted a sugar cane distillate. Does anyone think it's something other than sugar cane? Agave. Agave. Has that green, kind of grassy quality to it, the way we, like fibrous, the way we get in agave. Sometimes, like when you think about agave, um, tequila or mezcal has a smoky quality to it as well. Um, I know that, like, when I taste mezcal, you know, there's espadine, which is the big workhorse, kind of sweet, kind of, kind of fat, varies in smoke. I mean, there's, it actually can express itself in countless ways. I'm, I'm really stereotyping here, generalizing here. But there's another variety called Karwinski, which are the, they look like big pine cones in various forms versus big pineapples like in espadine. And in Karwinski, which is like Quiche, Madre Quiche, Barril, Tobasiche, these, these varieties, they are much more kind of vegetal and herbal and green in quality and vary in smoke as well, often less smoke because they're more expensive to produce. Um, okay, anyone else here think it's something other than agave or cane? Okay, so. Also got fruit notes, right? Fruity? I could be convinced it was a pear. Pear? How about tropical? Do you get any tropical notes in there? Totally. Which, what tropical flavors? Mango, papaya, yeah, it has that kind of like that, that a little bit of that mealy sort of uh, like tropical funk. I don't know. Unripe, unripe pineapple, banana maybe, a touch of banana, like not like super ripe banana, maybe like green plantain or something like this. Close to the skin. Estery, I mean, we talk about esters, which are these like long chain fatty acids that build up over the length of fermentation. Um, do you find this to be like high ester, medium ester, low ester? Medium it's, ester. It smells like funky rum. Funky rum. Funky rum, like more funky than the first rum agricole that we tasted? Yes. Okay. Do we know any places that produce funky rum? Jamaica. Jamaica produces funky rums. Um, is, this, is this like high, super high proof? I feel like often people associate super high proof with high ester. Like often, you know, you think about like Ray and Nephew or you think about like Smith and Cross or something like this. Like we always say like that high ester, funky, high proof rum. This isn't super high proof, right? No. Um, you want to mix this or drink this on its own? Either. 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 Good man. <laughs> Love it. Uh, cool. OK. And how about this last one? Speaking of, Parmesan. speaking of funky. Pa Parmesan cheese? Yeah. yeah, Parmesan cheese. Mineral or not mineral? Mineral. Light, medium, or full bodied? Full bodied. Uh, short, medium, or long finish? Does this taste inexpensive or expensive? That's a super dangerous question I was told not to ask. <laughs> Fuck it. I don't know. Some breaking and go against the rules here. Tastes like, a, tastes like a high quality distillate. I think there's something to be said for that. You know, the more you drink, whether that's wine or beer or spirit, like, you know, I think most people, like, know, what they know of beer is Budweiser or Coors or something like this. And then you taste, maybe you taste a beer for the first time that's brewed artisanally, and you're like, that's not even beer. I don't know what that is, because it's, like, so much more concentrated and weighty and made with care. You know, uh, same goes for wine, obviously, and same goes for spirit. Yeah, this is, this is made, this, I think this is made well. Um, we, we, you thought this is ricea. This is what you know of. When you say, when you think of ricea, this is what you think of. Cheesy. Cheesy. Yeah. This is something you sip on or something you mix? Sip on. Sip on. Yeah, I agree. Nice work, guys. Nice work. Um, yeah. So we're going to do these side by side. And look, we paired these two together because they both have that kind of like tropical, like lactic, salty funk to them. Uh, the first one is worthy is made by Worthy Park. This is rum bar. Uh, they're 40% for, they're uh, high ester rum. They make an overproof rum that's you know like 136, which is they, they call, when you go to Jamaica, they call the, the high proof stuff the white. They're white. What? 126, my boss. 
126. Uh, they call it the whites, drinking the whites. Uh, this, is, this is a rum the whole purpose was made to be able to use in larger quantities. You know what all the kids are drinking in Jamaica right now? Kids are, the kids are drinking rum pari. Uh, since since the, since they bought the distillery, you have Ray. It's like Ray and nephew, like 50-50, neat, with the 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 people of Jamaica. Oh, I'm sorry. Ray, yeah, yeah, yeah. Compare like uh, uh, Campari, and Ray and Ray and nephew are same owners. Um, yeah, cool. You dig this? I dig it. I dig it so much. Uh, it is, a, it is a cool pairing. Um, another thing, like when you go, when you think about like, there's very, um, the, the, drink, the other drink is like ting, and, uh, ting and, and rum. There's not a lot of, I feel there's not a lot of acid. When you go to the Caribbean, they don't add a ton of citrus into, into the cocktails at all. Obviously, we like to, we, I think we err on the side of more balance by, by using citrus uh, to, to balance things out. Um, cool. Dig it. Worthy, I just want to talk about Worthy Park for a second a little bit more because this is a special producer in general. Worthy, Worthy Park is like the geographical center of, of Jamaica. It's uh, in a um, uh, St. Catherine. Catherine a parish called right, St. Catherine. Uh, and they are, they are what is called a pure single, uh, single rum producer in that they grow their own sugar cane. They process their own sugar there. Uh, and where most people, that, and they process convert, they, they, they sell sugar, they make sugar, and then they also produce the molasses. And most people, for taxation purposes, you have to send your molasses away to like basically a facility that's like the government, who then like sends molasses back to you, but you're not really sure what you're getting back. Uh, because they happen to be located like right next to that facility, they, it's more just done through a transaction of money, not through a transaction of molasses. So soup to nuts, Growing sugar, producing sugar, producing molasses, and then going ahead and producing uh, their rums. They they have this beautiful foresight uh, still that they use, and it's it's super stunning. Um, and the rums are rums are great. Um, and rum bar, the name rum bar, just so you know where the name comes from, because it's important to know. Rum bar is like when you're driving along, like there's the high roads, which are like the well paved roads uh, that like you know the to the toll roads, right? And then there's the low roads, which is where all the people live. Um, and like a lot of the people, and like within these within these parishes, like often the distillery um, supports the economy. So a lot of the people work at the actual distillery. And as you're driving along these low roads, um, you have on both sides of the road these rum shacks or rum bars that are totally branded by whichever brand is the brand of your parish. Um, and so this both bears the name. This is the name of the brand, and also kind of uh, pays homage to the actual you know rum bar itself. That that exists everywhere. So again, like we, we said, we weren't going to get deep into like the difference between how pot still distillates and column still distillates taste today. Although I think that'd be a super interesting blind tasting as well that we should do in the future. Um, and because there are so many hybrid stills out there, it's, I mean, it, it's an interesting conversation how much that's really adding to distillate these days. But this is an example of. Yeah, that absolutely. included it uses a hybrid. Absolutely. That's right. They're able, especially like when you talk about the eau de vie that they produce. You know, they want to be able to like create this like fat textured eau de vie, uh, but then also clean it up so it doesn't just like burn your face off. It's really. Huh? Yeah. Oh, interesting. You should ask. Huh? Uh, so Las Perlas is ricea. This is a coastal ricea. I mean. That taste, if I had to guess if this were made on the coast or if this were made, this is like the Isla of Ricea, is what it tastes. It's right, right, right near Puerto Vallarta. Um, and they have two different types of stills that they use. Uh, they, have a, um, they have a stainless steel still to start with uh, that's, a little bit, that's a little bit larger. I think it's like, again, like maybe something like 300 or 350, don't quote me on that, liters. And then they have the second type of still that they use is called a Filipino still. Um, and it, it's made of copper, and copper, um, the reason copper is used kind of throughout is that, uh, you know, the charge of copper, if you remember your periodic table, uh, which I don't, uh, you know, binds with a lot of the congeners found in, in, in alcohol and helps clean up the spirit. It's why maybe you have, even if it's something as simple as like a copper, you know, copper swan's neck coming out of the top, any, any copper will, will help the situation out. Here, you're talking about a 21 to even longer day fermentation, uh, which is a, a chance for these, um, you know, rums to really uh, uh, build up uh, a lot of character. The two varieties here, one is called Amarillo and one is called Verde. 
it gets super complicated to really like keep it all straight in your head. Uh, but one of these is Angustifolia, which is Espadin, uh, and the other one is um, Meicano. So these kind of actually look somewhat similar to one another. Pretty, pretty good sugar content. You could feel the good sugar content in there. That's a really weighty spirit, even though it's savory and salty and bold and 48% alcohol. Um, you know, you could, you could feel that sugar uh, as well. And they do, after the first day of roasting, they open up the roast uh, and they go ahead. And, oh, oh one, worth noting. So, no, they don't inoculate here at all. Um, they propagate with estancia. They, prop they took wild yeast that was harvested from, from the field and they keep it alive, like a culture just like you would a sourdough, essentially, or like you know, making yogurt or something like this, uh, where here um, it just happens naturally through fermentation where they go ahead and they crush. Um, these guys ferment above ground in this big kind of like uh, this big tank above ground. These guys have a, um, a masonry stone tank built into the ground it's and a, huh? It's like, it's like a swimming pool. And a combination of both like this ambient yeast that exists and also this ambient temperature that exists around the tank slows down the fermentation process and leads to this high ester style of ricea. What about the yeast being used in the home market? I don't know, you tell me. <laughs> is it maybe also proprietary? Sure is. They have, they, have three, they have three different types of yeast. They have you know quick acting yeasts which, which are very efficient. It's like the equivalent of saying brewer's yeast or baker's yeast or something, you know, a champagne, something that's very efficient and leads to a quick fermentation, which has its benefits. Uh, and then you have these, these slower acting, especially when you're talking about something that's wild. It just doesn't, yeah, if you ever had like pizza, like I know there's some places in Brooklyn that like do, just do like wild fermentation where like, or what, like the starter, the, the dough just takes a while to get there and you could really taste it in the actual in the process. High ester. Primary one that takes a long time to ferment. Right. So similar, similar idea. That's why we showed them side by side, because they both have really long fermentation due to the yeast being less quick acting. Wow. The high sugar content of these riceas, is that is that indicative of the ricea style? Because I mean, even if I was to compare this to mezcal, at least to my memory, I don't remember feeling that much of a sugar. Sugar. I mean, you, you have you have a, it's a combination of like sugar to acid. Espadine in general can like really get high up there, like Araucano, Espadine, Tobala, mm, Habali, like some of these varieties can get quite high in sugar, like talking like 20 to 25 bricks. So now think about it like we just tasted that reasoning, like that type, where you know, like Estancia was like 12 uh, bricks, something like that, in between 12 to like 18, depending on the time they harvest. But, but the only thing that makes Ricea Ricea is where it's grown. Where, where, right, where it's grown, and then, you know, obviously there's, there's like, climate plays into things, too. If it, if it enjoys more sunlight, you know, you end up with higher sugar. If it's a cooler climate, it slows everything down, and then the time of year in which it's made changes things around as well. But these varieties, both of these are, like, pretty good sugar. Yeah. Good? Trayvon? Awesome. Great. Let's do this last, this last round. <laughs> 